Welcome back to our Intermediate Financial Accounting class. We'll continue our discussion of the conceptual framework and GAAP, where GAAP comes from, where it's going right now. We've talked a lot about all the different elements that go into financial accounting. We've talked about where GAAP comes from, and, and uh, we've started talking about IFRS and the convergence process between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. And as part of that, we want to continue our discussion talking about kind of where IFRS comes from and, and uh, what the IASB is like so that we can understand where these rules are, are really, uh, or how these rules are really developing. Okay? So with that, let's jump back into it. The IASB is set up a little bit different than FASB. FASB is set up with seven members. They are appointed by the Financial Accounting Foundation. Uh, IASB, same basic idea. There is a foundation, okay, that's governed by a group of trustees. And the trustees um, represent all the different continents, so Antarctica, of course, okay? But they represent all the different continents, and they appoint the members of IASB and decide who the chairperson is going to be. They also have created a group called the Standards Advisory Council that give ideas and suggestions to IASB. And they've created what we lovingly call the IFRIC. Okay, now the IFRIC also sets IFRS. The IFRIC's job is kind of like the EITF under U.S. GAAP. And if, if you don't remember, the EITF was designed to do a quick draft of a standard. And everybody follows that rule until FASB comes up with their rule. The IFRIC uh, does a very similar thing for uh, IASB. The only difference is IFRIC sets a rule, they send it to IASB. IASB votes and says, yeah, that'll work. Uh, U.S. GAAP doesn't have that once the EITF votes then it's good to go. Okay, So, interesting distinction between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. IFRS, um, the IASB has kept that final say in setting standards, even on the quick rules that uh, U.S. GAAP uh, and FASB don't have. Okay, Now, the process for setting GAAP is very much the same. Matter of fact, there's only a couple of differences here. So, let me just walk through it quickly. Again, we're going to draw some pictures, because I think that's the best way to remember it, of what the process looks like. So just like U.S. GAAP, they, they don't create a memorandum. Instead, they call it a discussion paper that, again, says this is what we're thinking the rule should be. And from that, they set, they can create a draft. And just like U.S. GAAP, after they set the draft, then they also hold roundtable discussions and talk about it and tell people, let people tell them what they think and they send in letters. Um, and they go through a, a process from draft through the round tables where they can set the actual standard. In the US GAAP, once the standard is set, it's done. They're finished. That's the last part. Under IFRS, however, there are two additional steps. First, IASB says it's part of their mission to educate others in how to use the standard. So they hold classes and they talk with different people and help them learn how to use the standard. Okay? And then once they've helped to do it, then they do an assessment. Once they've helped to teach people how, they do an assessment. Is this working the way we wanted it to, yes or no? And if the answer is no, then they can start the process all over again. Okay. Now, there's some parts about IFRS I don't care for, uh, just like there are some parts of U.S. GAAP I don't care for, but I like the fact that we have this extra step in the process, or two steps, where IASB has a, a specific role in helping to teach people how to use their rule. In addition, it's cool that they actually have a formal assessment process where they decide, yeah, this is doing what we want, or nah, this is not working, let's try again. So that's pretty cool, too. Now, even though the SEC says they want to, to change gears here, um, everybody's moving very slowly. Again, the SEC said they wanted to, then they've kind of backed off. Uh, the big four auditing firms, they really want it, because right now they're auditing under US GAAP and IFRS, because any firm that has a parent company in Europe or Canada is having to report IFRS numbers to them. Uh, so, so the big firms are doing those audits already. Um, but the big issue right now is we're just slowly moving forward. We're not converting, we're converging, and with that convergence process, um, we're just improving the weaknesses. So the two boards will say, hey, we've got a real concern with the leases. That's one they're talking about now. 
um, I think we ought to issue a joint standard. And with the joint standards, we're getting closer and closer and closer to a set of rules that are converged in the same. Okay? What you'll notice, though, even with those converged standards, they say they're the same, but in reality, they're not exactly the same. The, the meat and potatoes is the same, but they're still, uh, in the details, there's still quite a few differences between the two standards. So let's just talk latest news with convergence. Uh, in about 2008, the SEC came out and said, yeah, we're going to do this. And they uh, issued what they called a roadmap to let everybody know this is what's going to happen. And uh, they set up some dates uh, under this roadmap. And they said, if certain things happen, we are going to converge. And here was their timeline for convergence. And you'll notice some corporations, the big ones, we're going to adopt in 2010. That didn't happen. 2014, that's where we are uh, when I'm making these recordings. Large companies were supposed to be able to report now under IFRS, not happening. 2015 and 16, um, and then the idea was we published the roadmap in 2008. In 2011, we'll come back and decide, are we really going to do this? Well, part of the issue was politics. In 2008, there was a major shift in politics, to, and we got a, a brand new SEC chair who said, nah, I don't feel bound by that roadmap. But part of the rest of it was you know, we, we set some, st some um, conditions that we wanted IASB to meet in order for us to change from US GAAP to IFRS. And let's just briefly talk about those. First, they had to show improvement in quality, right? And we talked a little bit about this. We showed IFRS down here, remember? So we wanted to see them getting even better in the way that they're setting gap, their GAAP. Uh, second, we wanted to see improved convergence. So if you think about convergence right now, this middle section is converged between GAP and IFRS. And what they want to see is they want to see the details start to fill out so that everything is converged. Okay. Number three, they wanted to see an improvement in accountability. Uh, the big concern is um, FASB is funded through fees. So everybody who files with the SEC pays a fee, and that fee goes to FASB, uh, or part of that fee goes to, fa to, to FASB to pay them to set new rules. And they pay for their staff, and it pays for the research that they do, and the, the travel that they have to do to hold these roundtables, etc. Uh, IFRS is, is funded by donation, and there's a real concern that whoever gives the biggest donation has too much say. Now, right now, that's us, and we kind of like that. But we want to see them become more stable and not have this issue where they wouldn't get funding. Uh, the other thing we wanted to see was progress on XBRL language. This is a computer language. So we'll draw a very bad computer here. Yeah, that's not a good computer at all. No, nope, but it's just getting worse. OK, forget it. Just pretend I drew a computer. Maybe I should draw a Palm Pilot. There we go. We'll draw an iPad or some other tablet. There we go. Oh well, at least you can laugh about it, right? Anyway, uh, the idea is with XBRL, if you code things a certain way when you create your financial statements, then an investor or an analyst can go through using that computer language and pull out the numbers they want very easily. US GAAP follows it. Most companies are reporting using this coding. We want the IFRS statements to, to be the same way and have, have people provide these codes so that analysts and investors can get to this information quickly. The last thing we wanted was we wanted to see better education, having them help us to learn how to use their stuff. So that was the last, that's the last piece here, is we wanted to see better education about how to use IFRS. And, you know, we didn't get a formal assessment of these. I think they're moving forward on them, but as of right now, we're not quite there yet. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see um, what happens as we continue to move forward. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about in this segment is what we call the expectations gap. Um, people seem to think that there is truth in financial accounting, right? You have exact numbers, and the reality is there is no truth in financial accounting. There are rules to follow that you can follow appropriately or inappropriately. But think about depreciation, right? I'm assuming that piece of equipment is going to last for 10 years. It could last for 15. It could last for two. I don't know that. Well, since I don't know it for sure, I can't really get to anything like truth. I can just follow the rules, okay? So, well, people have this idea that not only is there truth, but they think that accounts are going to find all possible frauds 
and mistakes. Well, the only way that we could possibly find every single mistake and every single fraud is if we were at every single transaction. Okay, now think about this for just a minute. When was the last time you were in a Walmart? How many people were there buying stuff, going through the, the cashier's lanes while you were there? How many were there all day? How many were there all week? How many all year? What about all the Walmarts in all the world? Right? In order to be sure, 100% sure, that everything was done right, we'd have to have an account at every single till, in every single Walmart, everywhere. And that's just one end. That doesn't include the purchases, it doesn't include the debt payments, it doesn't include the interest, it's nothing. Right? It's too much. So what we do instead, as auditors, since we can't really be there, it'd be too expensive, it'd be cool for accountants, right? You'd need a million of us. Okay? Is what we're going to do is audit to find out if it is materially correct. It's the point at which a normal investor would change his or her decision. A normal, rational investor. Okay. Now imagine this for a second. Let's say that you were thinking about investing in a small mom-and-pop restaurant down the street. Okay. Nice little place, good food, but there's only one of them. And it's a pretty small business. Okay. If they were off by $10,000, would you change your mind? Probably, right? Because they're just a small business. Ten thousand dollars is a lot. That's material for them. It would change your decision. Now let's go back to Walmart. What if the Walmart books were off by ten grand? Would you care? Probably not. It's a multi-billion-dollar business. Ten thousand dollars is too small. That's the difference. We're going to audit and check to where it's materially correct, not perfect truth, right? And this difference here. This is the expectations gap, not to be confused with double A gap, okay? But this is the expectations gap. This gap is so wide where we think the auditors should be doing one thing and the accountant should be doing one thing, and here's what we really can do, that um, 20 cents of every dollar earned by the auditing firms, not income, revenue, is spent on lawsuits. Okay, because of this difference. Now, I tell you that, and I want to make sure you know that for a couple of reasons. If you're an accountant, brace yourself, it's coming. If you're not an accountant, back off and, and understand what it is we're doing and how we're checking, and, and don't expect us to somehow get to truth unless you're willing to pay for an auditor at every single till everywhere. Okay? All right, we're going to end with that. That's the first segment of this conceptual framework discussion. We'll come back in a little while and continue on with part two.